having so much fun just fellowshipping with you all. I'm, I'm starting to miss my cue here. Oh, it's a great day, beautiful day out there. God's blessing all the way around. And uh, I uh, just want to give a couple announcements. Uh, we have um, the, uh, the normal Holy Spirit um, community group uh, on, uh, that would be Tuesday at 11, I believe, at 10, okay, 10 o'clock, Tuesday, okay, uh, then uh, per power hour is Wednesday at 8 to 9, and my favorite thing is this coming Friday is we have a, a couple's fellowship dinner, and any couples, whether you're married or, or dating or just finding somebody to come with, uh, come on. Uh, we uh, are um, uh, in um, New Columbia, Bonanza. Uh, you go out 80 and get on 15, like you're going to Lewisburg, and, and, and it's probably just right on, on the right there. Uh, so uh, put it in your GPS and, and come on out. And uh, we'll have a good time at fellowship and, and eating a lot of good food. So uh, let's go to prayer right now. Heavenly Father, you own this day. Father, you, you own this service. Let us serve you as we can. Let us enjoy the fellowship with other of your children. Let us dwell in the Holy Spirit. Feed us today, Lord. Give us what we need for this week. Give us what we need for life. Forgive us any trespasses that we've made. And, and Father, help us to be forgiving. Lord, bless the song time. Bless the, uh, the preaching. Let your word be known. You are why we are here. May you be exalted and, and magnified. Let your name be heard throughout. Lord, we give you the praise and the honor. And we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Chris prayed about fellowship and food feeding. And it reminded me that we have a food fellowship coming up next Sunday. So I'm going to pass this around. And if you're going to be here and would like to contribute something, it's a potluck, you're more than welcome to put your name down. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to stand and we are going to worship, but as... Chris was praying, I was just reminded of the scripture, and I'm going to paraphrase it, and I don't know where it's found, but it is in scripture, I promise, and it talks about how if we will not praise the Lord, praise God, then the rocks will cry out, um, and we want to be people who praises the Lord, right? Because he has done so much for us that things that we don't even know about, but we could we could stand here for hours and list all the things that we do know about, all the blessings God has given us. And it is just an honor and a joy to be able to worship him every Sunday uh, with all of you. So would you please stand? I'm especially excited to worship for a reason that I will tell you in just a couple minutes.
drummer again? Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you looked at the bulletin, it shows the songs, and we're going to do a little bit of a different order today, um, but that's not why I'm excited. I am excited because I have someone here who is going to sing with me this morning. So Heather, can you come on up? This is one of Heather's <clears throat> favorite songs. Mike, Mike, um, I didn't tell you that we're doing the last song second, Lord Rain and Me, you're good? All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, Heather, are you ready? Oh, yes, baby. <laughs> All right, I think. I th <laughs> All righty. You're so funny, Heather. <laughs> I love you. I love you too. All right, we are ready. Let's go, let's do it. <laughs> well, yeah, we're sure. <laughs> Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request. Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again?
Amen. Yeah. Now, you know, Heather and I have something in common besides our names. <laughs> Actually, and we are the same age. Yeah. We're both 29, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, she said she's 24. <laughs> but also, this is one of Heather's favorite songs, and it is my favorite song, this Lord Reign in Me. So, oh, all right, I hope you enjoyed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we just are so thankful that we can come and worship your great and your holy name, that we can do so um, with joy. Um, and, and we just felt such joy as we sang, as we worshiped you this morning. And so, God, I pray that we will continue to feel that joy um, as we listen to Pastor share the words that you have put on his heart. We pray that they would be your words, that they would touch our hearts, that they would change our lives, that they would transform us. I pray all of this in your name. Amen. I'm, I'm loud enough. You could probably hear me. <laughs> okay. Well, we don't need to repeat that, but good morning. Um, this morning I'm going to read uh, Psalm 12 in its entirety. Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips speak with deception. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says... We will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? But be because of the opposition, oh, I'm sorry, because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined on a furnace of clay purified seven times. O oh Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. The wicked freely strut about when... What is vile is honored among the people. It's from Psalm chapter 12. Thank you, Sister Cheryl. Thank you, Heather, Heather, and Sam. I like, I can say that. Heather, Heather, and Sam. Heather. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot you were back there. <laughs> I don't like liver, you know that, but no, you're not chopped liver. You're not chopped liver. Anybody here like liver besides Paul? Oh, wow, okay. Just pray for our church. Uh, well, I know that the last time we offered the uh, joiners cards, we offered the joiners cards. There were a few people who did not get any because we ran out. If there was anyone who wanted a joiners card and you're here today, just raise your hand. If you're not here today, raise your hand. Anybody who wanted a joiners card? Well, no, you are here, brother. I see you from here. You want one? Okay. I'll give you five. How's that? Thank you. <clears throat> there's anyone visiting us here for the first time first time in a long time or first time ever please raise your hand we have something for you brother Caleb can you do me a favor sorry about the, I should have warned you first but uh, anybody first time just raise your hand one more time first time thank you well, we're happy that you're here to join us. Hope that you enjoy this service. And the guy to your left, I think I know him. And the one to his left, I know him as well. All right. Uh, I did want to say that the Friday night couples outing is full. We have no more room. We have 15 couples going. That's standing. Anything up to that, after that would be standing room only. So 
Uh, we have 15 couples, most that we've ever, ever had. We've taken a three-year uh, break because of COVID, and we've opened the door, and the first year we're already getting 15 people, so uh, 15 couples. So praise God for that. So let's keep that in prayer. I will send you an email this week to remind you. Uh, it's, it, it is in Columbia, PA. It's about 25 minutes from here, and New Columbia, I'm sorry, New Columbia. And the other thing is, if anyone wants to carpool with someone, we don't need uh, 30 cars over there or 15 or 12 cars, whatever. We can carpool. So just kind of check with someone who's going and see if you can either carpool with them or they carpool with you. Okay, so that's available as well. Any questions? Okay. February 11, 2024. Two people were injured and one suspect was killed during a shooting at Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church on Sunday afternoon, Texas authorities say. The suspect, who was a woman, entered the church with a long rifle. She was wearing a backpack and a trench coat and was accompanied by a small child, approximately four to five years old, Finner said. Police said that the two people were injured, include, that two people were injured, a 57-year-old man who was shot in the leg, and the child that the shooter came with was also injured and remains in critical condition. I do not know the condition of that child this morning. February 14, 2024, one person has died, and at least 21 others were injured by gunfire when a shooting broke out in Kansas City, Missouri, following the parade and rally for the chief Super Bowl win. win. Tragedy. Three suspects have been detained, the Kansas police said. Gunshot victims were transported to several hospitals in the area, including eight with immediately life-threatening injuries and seven with life-threatening injuries, according to interim Kansas City Fire Chief. And, and I can go on and on and on. You know, the war in Israel, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the state of affairs in our country, etc., but, but, but I, I choose not to. I instead want to talk about, um, I want to talk about what do we do? You know, I want to talk about, you know, how do we, how do we uh, maintain our composure? And, and there's only one, one place to turn to to provide us with help. What would God have us to do, right? Or, or, or how can we get close to God regarding what is happening because he is totally aware of all that is happening. He's totally aware. He is totally aware of what's going on in our world. And so um, how do we get close to God in order to know what it is that we're to do? <clears throat> so today the, the Holy Spirit through David wants to give us lead way as to some of the answers to these questions. Uh, God is faithful to his word. He knows what's going on, and we're going to trust him to do that today. Amen? What I want us to do is stand together in prayer. We'll title today's message up on the screen, How to Deal with Our Times. How to Deal with Our Times. Let's pray. Father, we, we praise you and we thank you for being the Father. We praise you and thank you for being Lord. We thank you and praise you for being here with us this morning, Holy Spirit of God. Uh, I pray for every heart. Lord, even those listening online, pray for every heart. I pray for everyone who is uh, hearing your word, Father, in the name of Jesus. Would you prepare us? Would you remove all obstacles, all hindrances, all, all concerns of anything else other than what you want to say to us this morning? Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. We pray that you would come against everything and anything that the enemy would do to interfere uh, with your word this morning. I can, can commit to you every single heart. Man, woman, and child, and pray that Holy Spirit, you would be free to speak uh, into where we're at in our walk with you, we pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so much like today, right? Much like in our day today, uh, in the day and time of David, there was a lot going on. There was a lot happening in that day. There was a lot happening during his time, a lot that would stimulate or gave reason to stimulate uh, um, discouragement, worry, or even frustration. What did he do? How did, how did he deal with that? What did, 
what did David, how did he respond to what was going on in his life? We're going to consider some of that today and try to somehow in some way connect it with our own life. Connect it to our own circumstances and our own situation, our own culture today. So let's consider that and let's see what, what it is that God wants to say to us this morning. <clears throat> I want us to notice up on the screen um, David's concern. Notice his concern. In verses 1, 2 that was read and verse 8, it says, Help, Lord. David the psalmist takes time to call upon the Lord. Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among people. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips, they speak deception. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among people. So, so David looked around himself. He looked around the environment. He looked around what was happening, and, and um, he was concerned. Uh, perhaps disturbed, maybe like us in a way, but nonetheless concerned about what was going on. He was concerned that the faithful of the land seemed to be vanishing. In other words, it was getting harder and harder to find men and women and children that love God. And David was really realizing that, and, and it, it, it concerned him. It, it made him feel awkward. It made him worried. It made him, but nonetheless, he was concerned. He saw the need. Listen to some other translations, that how they, de, how they describe verse 1. The common English Bible says, Help, Lord, because the godly are gone. The faithful have completely disappeared from the human race. The International Standard Version, help, Lord, for godly people no longer exist. Trustworthy people have disappeared from humanity. The TLV, today's Living Bible, says, Lord, help, help. Godly men are fast disappearing. We're in the world, we're in, in all the world can dependable people be found. The New English Translation says, deliver, Lord, for godly the godly have disappeared. People of integrity have vanished. I believe that there were godly people around them those days. Maybe not too much. Uh, David wasn't the only one, but, but David, you know, David is exaggerating a bit here. He's, he's using hyperbole. He's speaking, he's, he's exaggerating in order to emphasize the intensity of his situation. We do that all the time, don't we? I'm so hungry, I could eat a, eat a horse. Oh, I told my wife the other day, honey, I got to get to, I got to get to Walmart. I'm going to fly there in a rush. I'm not going to literally fly there, but it's, it's, it's basically using exaggeration in order to express the intensity of that moment. And so, yeah, there were people there, but there were evidently not a whole lot of people. And if there were a lot of people, they weren't hiding because of the situation. We'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. But David was feeling, he was feeling all alone in the ministry of God. It, they, David felt that, the, that God had no one on his side to speak on his behalf. And it troubled him. It, it, it gripped his heart. Um, it made him feel awkward. He was alone, he felt. No wonder he cried out, Lord, help. He wanted help. He realized that he needed help. It was the way that people spoke. It was the way that they, that they uh, described their situations. It was, it was how they conducted themselves. It's the way they expressed uh, their, their thoughts and how they, how they felt and how they believed and what they believed. That was what was disturbing David. He heard people speaking words of flattery and words of pride and selfish words and oppressive words. And that was troubling David. Where are the godly? It was the way that they spoke that he's concerned about. It was the way that the world was turning. And he knew that God was not satisfied with that. And especially when God was being minimized himself by the people, by what they thought. And then, and then in verse 8, um, we have a, a fearful description of the times that we're living in. When you think about it, in verse 8, 
Listen to that verse one more time. He says, the wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among the people. We're worshiping. We're, today we are worshiping godless lifestyles. And that's what, to me, affected me regarding the times that we're living in. We are continually living and proudly and shamelessly exposing vileness as if we don't care what the people say. And even worse, we don't care what he said. We don't care what he says. <clears throat> My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. We don't care what he says. It, it, it doesn't matter. See, David knew that something was wrong. David knew that, that something was not going right. Where are the faithful? What have happened to those who would stand up against this generation? He knew who to call upon. He calls upon God because he knew that man cannot solve the problems. Church, the solution of our world are not solvable by man. And David knew that. David knew that we need to turn to God. In fact, the problems of our world began when we took God out of the equation altogether. No more praying in schools. I mean, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God, because of those two words, we don't even want to hear that said in school anymore. And so we've pushed God out of the way. And so the psalmist knew that the only hope for our world, that the only hope for the situation was turning to God. It was beyond man. Let me read something to you from uh, Ray Stedman's Spiritual Warfare. We've simply pushed God out the way. The same people who tell us that the Bible is no longer relevant and trustworthy never stop to ponder the fact that the further our society moves away from the teaching of Scripture, the more debased, corrupt, and cruel humanity becomes. As the world has moved away from belief in God and the Bible, we have been corresponding rise in crime, political corruption, teenage pregnancies, teen suicides, divorces, fatherless children, disrespect for marriage, single parent families, abortion, pornography, drug, drug abuse, alcoholism, racism, plus a general decline in personal integrity, responsibility, decency, and civility. The worse the world gets, the more people aptly apply the solutions that created the problems in the first place. And that is why there is a spiraling upward of social ills and a spiraling downward of morality and decent or decency in the world. Something happens when we push God out of the way. And even the, the most uh, committed atheist in the world, if he doesn't look at what's going on in our world and admit that something is not right indicates the condition of his heart. Especially with regard to God the Creator who left directions for us on how to live properly. So he observed the, the convictions, he observed the condition of society and he was concerned because of the damage that it was bringing within society. Much like today, if you think about it, um, God doesn't, church, God doesn't want us to, to be oblivious to what is going on. The psalmist was concerned. Evidently, he took time to look. He took time to look at the news. He took time to open to CNN. He took time to look at Fox News. He took time to, to read the headlines and, and realize that something was wrong and he was concerned. And God wants us to, to be concerned. God wants us to realize that something is happening, something is not right, and something needs to be done. Uh, he doesn't want us to be, he wants us to be concerned about what is going on, not to be oblivious to a church. We cannot undo the fulfillment of the prophecy of Scripture, but we are part of that fulfillment. 
So God wants us to, to he, he wants us to be concerned about what is going on, do not be oblivious to it, and to allow him to do what he wants to do in and through your life during this time of prophetic fulfillment. The psalmist saw and he was concerned. The psalmist saw and he wasn't comfortable. The psalmist saw and it, it nudged him the wrong way. He knew something was wrong and he cried out to God. It's so easy to turn, on the, to turn off the TV and want nothing to do with it. I mean, I've heard it said, and I would recommend don't spend a whole lot of time watching the news. Spend more time re reading his word. But uh, nonetheless, we have to know what's going on so that we know how to pray. And not only know how to pray, but that we also know how, how to pursue God regarding what we're to do in these days. What role does the church play in the latter days, what role does the church play as we approach the coming of Christ? Is there a role, role that we play? There is. Now, some might have different callings and perspectives within it. Some might be, be called to do different things than others. But nonetheless, the church plays a role in the times that we're living in. And it's up to us to determine what that role is, but we are not to be oblivious as if it, did it, as if it wasn't happening. Don't raise your hand. Uh, how many of you are acting like it's not happening? Don't raise your hand, please. Or as if, if it's okay, God's in control, so we don't need to do anything. That is not God's design. God caused the church to be active in doing what it's supposed to do in the latter days. Yes, the, the, the future depends on what we do in the present. We can fix some of the things that are going on, church. We play a role individually within our workplaces, within our communities, within our homes, within our church, and within our world. We do play a role. So his concern. Secondly, I want you to notice his conviction. He doesn't leave it there. He's got conviction. Uh, up in the, on the screen, verses 3 and 4, may the Lord cut off all, this is his conviction. This is what's in his heart. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says we will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? 2024. Say that again. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, says the psalmist, and every boastful tongue that says we will triumph with our tongues. In other words, we will say whatever we want. We own our lips. No one owns us who is our master. So David's desire was to cut off all flattering lips and, and all boastful tongues to do away with it altogether. Boy, did he break the First Amendment. Imagine that. The freedom of speech. How dare he, right? But he's not saying so much that people are not to say what they want. He's more talking about what it is that they're saying and the purpose behind it. Uh, yeah. We live in a day and age where what is politically correct is what must be said. You want to be at peace with all the people you meet? Just say what's politically correct, even if you disagree with it. The problem is that um, if you do not say what's politically correct, they'll, they'll remove you from Twitter or X. Get, to get, get that, they'll X you out of X. I, I prefer to say what's biblically correct and not what's politically correct. And I'll say, as I've said before from this pulpit, political correctness is evidence that stupidity is contagious. And it certainly is. It's what's politically correct. So, so the psalmist is not saying so much that they're not supposed to say, they're not supposed to speak what they want to speak. The problem is that, yes, we have the freedom of speech, and they had the freedom of speech, but they had to make sure that what they said in their speech was politically correct. The problem was more that what they were saying, they wanted to say what they wanted to say as they wanted to say, regardless of what it was, regardless of who it had heard regardless of the fact that they were simply wanting to be selfish on their own and they wanted to say and do and live as ever they wanted, however they wanted to. 
That was the problem. It was their own sinful, selfish pride that uh, confirmed who they were that the psalmist was against. And so he says, where are the godly? I'm thinking that maybe there were more godly people than he thought, but they were afraid to say what they wanted to say because they were afraid to be excommunicated or to be burnt or to be defeated or to be overtaken. And so the godly were in hiding. They didn't want to say Jesus is Lord because they'd be in trouble. They might lose their job if they say, I don't agree with that terminology or I don't agree with this position. They might lose their job. And so they preferred to stay quiet. Maybe there were godly people all around him, but not godly enough to say what God wanted to say through them. And so he says, the godly are no more. Yes, I believe that the godly were. I just believe that they were not godly enough to say what God wanted them to say. God calls us to speak his word. He calls us to declare the word. Listen, the only word that breaks the yoke of slavery and bondage is the word of God. And if we're not sharing the word and the hope behind it, church, Captivity continues. Bondage continues. The world continues in its own way because there's no one there from the housetops declaring the message of hope. There is hope. And here's the thing. People are looking for hope. They're just finding it through the wrong people because the wrong people are bringing a hopeless message that sounds like it's got hope behind it. <clears throat> so his conviction was basically, this is David. This is what he felt. This is, this is where he was at. This is what he was feeling. His conviction was, get rid of these people altogether. Get rid of them. I don't want to see them any longer. This was David. Listen to some of these verses. This is not on, in the, on the screen. But he had a way of expressing himself. Right? Psalm 3 and verse 7. Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Psalm 55, 15. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the grave of the dead. For evil finds lodging among them. Psalm 143, 12. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes. For I am your servant. And, and church, reading these verses, say, man, David had no heart. David was a heartless man. He didn't care for people. He didn't love people. But that's not true. As you read the Psalms, you find that David loved people. And David encouraged people. And David encouraged bringing the message. But maybe they just got to him here. David was the one who, um, when he began to organize his first army, who did he pick up? The nothings of the world. He picked up, if I can use our terminology, the people that were homeless living in the street with nothing to do. He picked up those who had no talents and no abilities, who just wanted to kill. They were murderers. They should have all been in prison, but there was David picking them up and bringing them into his fold and organizing his own army with these kind of people. And those people, he began to teach what integrity was all about. If you remember the story, on two occasions, uh, David's enemy, Saul, for no reason, wanted to kill David. And David's men said, let's go kill him. Remember, he was, in the, he was in the cave sleeping. And they encouraged David, let's go kill your enemy once and for all. Let's get rid of that bum. And David said, no, we will not dishonor the, the, the chosen man of God. David taught them how to forgive. He taught them how to behave. He taught them how to believe in themselves. He taught them how to prove to society that they're, no, that they're not no good. And so he wasn't a man who didn't care. But David is expressing his own conviction, but I want you to notice that he does not take matters into his own hand. So David could have easily said, you know, I'm going to go out there and get rid of them one, one after the other. I'm going to destroy them myself because no one else is doing it. No godly people are here. But no, he commits them to the Lord. He doesn't take matters in his own hand. He was just expressing his feeling to the people. Scripture teaches us that we're to love our enemies. 
It teaches us that, that, that we are to be there for our enemies. And church, the more we teach them or tell them or share with them the message of hope, and the more they curse God and His Word and what He says in His Word and His people, the more they do that, the more it gives us reason to maybe back off and go speak to someone else and entrust that people or that person into the care of God that He would do what He deems best. Let God deal with those situations. Hebrews 10.31 says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so David's expressing himself. He's con expressing his conviction. This is what he's feeling. This is what he wants. So we know about his concern. We know about his, con his conviction. Let's look at his consolation up on the screen. His consolation. This is where God leads us, church. This is what we need to do. We need to be concerned about what's going on. We need to play our role. We need to see God's face regarding our role in this world, in this day and age. That we're here for a reason. It's okay to express your convictions, but commit that to the Lord. And then his consolation, third point, his consolation, verses 5 through 7. Because of the oppression, now for the first time, God is speaking. David has said his peace in the first four verses. God speaks here in verse 5. Because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign or hurt them. So God has spoken. God has spoken on behalf of the people. Perhaps some of these people were those who were hiding were those who were afraid to speak what they wanted to speak or what they believed. I will protect them from those who are groaning. I will protect the weak and the groaning of the needy. And I will arise, says the Lord. I will protect them, my people, from those who hurt them. Verse 6, the psalmist picks up, and the words of the Lord are flawless. So he, he held on to God's word. Please don't miss this. That in everything that is going on in our world, we need to draw to God's word because he has a master plan. Because he has a word to say about what is going on. In other words, he is not oblivious. He's not un unknowing of what's happening. In other words, we don't need to remind God of what's happening. We can just ask him what it is that he wants us to do. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. Imagine the purity of that silver. Oh, Lord, you will keep us safe. By the way, he uses the word us, so there are other godly people. You will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. So David makes this plea, right? He, he makes this plea, this petition before the Lord. And then God provides the reply. God replies. And I want you to know, church, this morning that God, his ears are always open to our prayers. But his eyes are open looking, always looking in our hearts. And when those two are connected, when the words that we speak in prayer and the condition of our hearts are right with God, God will move. God will move. God will answer in one way or another. It's not always yes. Sometimes it's no and sometimes it's wait. But God will answer when those two conditions are met. And I want you to notice that up to this point, David's concern has not been resolved. He's still in his situation. He's still concerned about the same things. The same surroundings are still happening in his society, in his world, in his day. Uh, so he doesn't have it, but he has the promise of the blessing. And he held on to that. David, as you read the Psalms, you'll find this time and time and time and time again that he often begins with a concern or a worry, a fearful or a worrisome thing going on in his life or in his kingdom, in his, in his days. And, and he always ends in praise. Oh, Lord, you will keep us safe and you will protect us from such people forever. See, most people that you ask them, if you ask them, do you, do you think that God can see you through this situation? Do you think that, that God can deliver you from your circumstance? They'll tell you, yes, I do. They know God can. 
They just don't know if he will. See, in consolation, we don't, we don't just have confidence that God can, but we have this tranquility, we have this peace in knowing that he will according to his will. And the peace comes from knowing that if it, if it, if it is not his will, then what he wills is best because he sees the future. When our request is wrong, God says no. When the timing is wrong, he says slow. And when you are wrong, he says grow. There's a process by which God takes us as he answers prayer for us. The most important thing in our prayer is that we're trusting God to answer according to his will. Which is what Jesus taught us to do at Gethsemane, right? He said, God, take this cup away from me. I don't want to go to Calvary. This is the human side of Jesus. Take this cup away from me. And then he says, yet not my will, but your will. That's consolation. Consolation is not necessarily getting what I want. It's getting what he wants and trusting him to be faithful in giving what he wants. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's best. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you took a job one day that turned out to be the worst job you ever wanted and you thought it was God providing? Or dated someone that you thought this was the best person in the world and then only to find that it wasn't. And you prayed and sought God and you thought that that was it? Consolation is knowing that he knows what's best. Knowing what I want and saying, Lord, this is what I want but not my will, your will, because you know what I need. There's a big difference between what I want and what I need. And he knows what's best for us. And so the psalmist has consolation. He knows in verse 6, God promised that he will perform. So he knows in verse 6, let me read verse 6 again. It's up on the screen. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times over. That would be the purest of the purest that you can get it. The number seven in the scriptures is always indicating something of perfection and completeness. And so seven times over, I, the silver is as complete, as pure, as perfect as it can possibly be. So is the word of God, says the psalmist. So when we think about God, in him there is no flattery. In him there is no deceit. In him, there is no taking back. In him is truth, reliability. We can hold on to that. If he said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's an old hymn. Yes. And so um, let me finish with these thoughts. He did, okay, here's, here's the powerful thing about God's word. Um, how many of you have seen God move in your life before? Right? Has, how many of you, has he ever answered a prayer? Has he ever seen you through a time that you just didn't know how it was going to happen? Right? Has he made something happen that you never expected would happen? Has he proved himself faithful? Has he proved himself reliable? Because that's what the psalmist did. The psalmist remembered what the Lord has done. Listen to some of his views, not on the screen. 1 Samuel 17, 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. So David was in his dilemma throughout his life, was in a dilemma in struggles and challenges. In fact, he could not build the temple of the Lord because he shed too much blood. And so he was always in danger, always in trouble. And here he is again in 1 Samuel 17. And he says, the Lord will rescue me, not has rescued me. He will rescue me from the hand of the Philistines. Chapter 18, verse 40 of Psalm. He says, you made my enemies turn their backs in flight, and I destroyed my foes. He's remembering what God did before. A good many of you raised your hand about things he's done before. Can you believe him to do it some more? In chapter 18 and verse 40 of Psalms, he says, he says, you exalted me above my foes from violent people. You rescued me. And church, 
when we're praying and we're seeking God, it's okay to turn the focus of prayer from what I need or from my dilemma or my challenge or my struggle. Change it from that to who He is and what He's done. Try that sometimes. Try turning to Him and calling upon Him and recognizing and claiming and upholding who He is and what He's done. That's what the psalmist did. The psalmist began to realize who God was based on what God had done in the past and based on who He is or was to him, to David himself. And so his consolation was in knowing that. Someone said, when the enemy worries you or accuses you, let the Word of God assure you. The psalmist hung on to the word. He was concerned. He saw something. He took it to God. And then God responded. And David remembered the promises and the faithfulness of God and what he had done in the past. And he claimed that he will do it again. If God is not doing it now, it doesn't mean he's not going to do it later. And there might be a time in your life and my life uh, where, where he's developing something within us as we continue to bring our petitions to him. And so if we can continue the pet petitions by claiming his faithfulness and his promise. In church, when God promises something, there is no ifs and buts about it. It may not be when we want it, but it's going to be because he's promised it. And so we bank on to his promises. I want to read something to you. It's, it's called, God means just what he says. God means just what he says. Listen to this. There are some who believe the Bible, and some who believe in part, and some who trust with reservation, and some with all their heart. But I know that it's every promise, but I know that it's every promise is firm and true always. It is tried as the precious silver, and it means just what it says. It is strange. We trust each other and only doubt our Lord. Isn't that right? It is strange that we trust each other and we only doubt our Lord. We will take the word of mortals and yet distrust his word. Boy, is that going on in our world today. What does social media have to say about God? What does social media have to say about our world? What does social media have to say about what's going on today? Disregard what he said. What does social media said? Because that's what I'm going to believe. That's what I'm going to live well like. That's what I'm going I'm to allow to govern my mind and my thoughts and my convictions on a day-to-day -day basis. Not what he said, but what social media says. That's the days we're living in. God means what he says. We will take the word of mortals and yet distrust his word. But oh, what light and glory would shine over all our days if we always would remember that he means just what he says. Yes. That's what the psalmist did. He was concerned, and so are we, I hope. And he had his convictions. And yes, we can express it to God however we want, but never take matters into your own hand. Entrust to God what is out of your control, but allow God to work in you with what he's given you to have control over. So how did David deal with the issues of his day? How did he react with his, what did he do up on the screen? His concern. Do not be oblivious, church, to what is going on. It should concern you. It should, it should burden you. It should make you feel awkward. It should cause you to pray. It should cause you to cry. It should cause you to call out to God. His concern was real, and we need to be real about our world, and we need to be real about our days. His concern, his conviction. Yeah, he, he prayed that they'd be removed, but he entrusted them into the care of God. And, and, and in our conviction, we want to see God's face, and we, we, we want to make sure that, Lord, that, that, that we're, we're doing what we're here to do in these days. We weren't born 100 years ago, nor will we be born 100 years from now. We're born now for this day and age, and God wants to use us today. Not tomorrow, not last year. 
but today. And so his conviction, he prayed about it, he entrusted them to God, and then his conclusion or his consolation, he found rest in God's word. He found hope, he found purpose, he found meaning, he remembered the past, he remembered what God did, he remembered who God was, and that gave him consolation. It doesn't mean that everything changed immediately for the psalmist. It doesn't mean that, that the godly began to pop up from behind the woods. It doesn't mean that society changed immediately. It means that it gave him peace and consolation in his dilemma. Church, we need that today. My peace I give you, said Jesus in John 40, 14, 27. Right? I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Trust in God. Jesus encourages us in his word. And the psalmist found his consolation in the promises of God. Church, the best way to change society is to allow God to first change us. God works through individual people in their scope, wherever they're at, to change and to touch lives and to provide hope in our situation. And if they, the whole body of Christ worldwide, missionaries alike, are uh, in tune with God, he's going to touch people in their culture, in their situation, in their day, in their time, where they're at. Imagine that a church being busy about God's faithfulness and God's promise in a world that seems hopeless, with no direction and no purpose, though it thinks it has it. How do we deal with our times? We must be concerned. We must express our convictions. And we must find solace or consolation in the Lord. Next week, we'll talk about part two. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and bless you this morning for your grace. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Father, we know that we know this day that there are all kinds of demons that are designed and planning on a daily basis to, basis to disrupt lives and to destroy lives, and to turn men and women away from you, God. But Lord, our world needs you, and you're here to be, to be had. You're here to make yourself available. And you, you do it through us, through your people. So Holy Spirit, break every hold in our lives, everything that is interfering with us being men and women that bring the light of Jesus, the hope of Christ, not just by our words, but by how we live that we will not live as the world tells us to live. We will not think as the world tells us to think. We will not react as the world tells us to react. We'll do it as you tell us to. In the name of Jesus, break every hold and every obstacle, every hindrance in our lives in the name of Jesus. Raise up a church, and a triumphant church, that is busy and ready to be a light for Jesus, that fearlessly declares our hope and the hope of mankind. Father, what breaks the yoke is being silenced by the father of lies through the media. Political correctness is not the answer. Biblical correctness, that's what breaks the yoke. And so, Father, we bless you and praise you this morning for your word and your promise and for the many hands that went up saying yes. God showed himself to me. Yes, God delivered me. Yes, God answered a prayer I didn't think he could answer. Yes, God made something happen that I never thought would happen. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that, that we would realize your power and your faithfulness and what you do today in our lives gives us reason to trust you to do it some more tomorrow. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. I commit to you these, your servants, those online, your servants, and those that might not be yet, that are right in the middle, wondering if this whole Jesus thing is true, or right there in the middle, wondering what in the world is going on with our world. Would you show them the frailty of man and turn them to the reality of your word? Holy Spirit of God, have your way in our day and age. Forgive us for not realizing always that you're seated on the throne and that you are the final word and the authority and that nothing that is going on in our world surprises you 
If anything, you told us to read about it in your word. But remind us that you're not quite finished yet. In fact, we know, we know the end of the story. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. And thank you for the hope you leave with us on our day-to-day -day basis. Help us to play the role you've called us to. The least likely person in this church this morning. God wants to use you. Let's trust him for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We will not have any closing song today, so that is the ending of You know the agenda of today for them. Guide them and direct them. Lord, I do pray for his mother. And I thank you that she's better. Pray that you continue to bring healing there. But Lord, be with us, Lord, as we begin this new week. Guide us and direct us. Help us to be alert to those moments, those open door opportunities you give us to share the message of hope in hopeless times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You made it, babe.